Hey everybody, Charles Hoskinson here. I wanted to make a video to talk about the uh, ETC uh, proposal meeting that we had uh, today. I, it was rather inconven inconveniently timed. I, I had to get up at around 5.30 in the morning, prepare for it. And uh, some of my guys actually had to get up 4.30 in the morning and uh, get to it and ready for it. We showed up with our, our CTO, some lead engineers, uh, Brian McKenna, and um, also one of the scientists. And we moved a lot of meetings to make sure that uh, we had this. Our understanding of the meeting was that it would be a meeting to discuss the checkpointing solution that we'd come up with and we were going to present an ECPI, ECIP uh, next week, Wednesday on. Uh, apparently, it was only a small item on the agenda, and other m items on the agenda uh, were things like changing the consensus algorithm of ETC uh, and uh, alternative systems like Pearl Guard and uh, Veriblock, and there was no one there to represent any of those ideas. And to be honest, I'm not really sure what the point of the meeting was. They said it was kind of a filter meeting, uh, but this is not how these things ought to be done. So instead of just complaining, I'd like to propose a slightly different way of doing business that I think would be much more fair to everybody in the ecosystem uh, and also uh, make sure that we actually make good decisions. Uh, it's not necessarily the things that you decide that define you, it's the process you follow to get to those decisions and the legitimacy behind them. Uh, so uh, if you will, I have a little presentation. So first, uh, there's this concept of understanding. These are not simple topics. Uh, for example, how does proof of work work or proof of stake work? There's enormous details there. And they're deeply technical, a lot of science, uh, a lot of security considerations and so forth. And really the first goal of any ECIP should be to gain a degree of understanding amongst the people. So my recommendation is whoever is proposing it does a presentation and that presentation, uh, maybe it's audio or video, but it, it the goal of the presentation is to try to explain in the most useful way possible uh, what they're trying to accomplish and how, what and how. And the people who are watching that presentation, they should be given the opportunity for a lot of Q&A and the point here isn't to kill the proposal, rather it's to understand what exactly they're doing and ask for clarity. Okay, if you walk into with a hostile mind, uh, you're not really gonna get anywhere. So even if you oppose what the person's trying to do, the point is you're trying to understand at a deeper level to a point where you actually get it as much as the person proposing it. And you know, when you ask what and how, you know, things like, uh, you know, what what exactly in the system is going to change? Um, you know, how is this actually proposed to be implemented? Uh, you know, the, these types of things. Then the next level uh, in the process is practicality. Now, practicality is all about well complexity. And again, the goal here in understanding the practicality is not to kill or no kill. This is not the goal. Uh, this is rather still in that understanding phase. Okay. And when we wrangle complexity, we're asking things like, do we need a hard fork? Uh, do we need substantial code changes for this? Does this uh, fundamentally change the way that we've been doing things? Like, for example, if I propose going from Ethereum-style accounts to extended UTXO, this is not a very practical thing for most cryptocurrencies. Why? Because there is every single smart contract would have to be fundamentally rewritten to be compatible with extended UTXO. Uh, so you kind of have to start with that model or have a device like Chimeric Ledgers or, and have both accounting models live at the same time, uh, but the practicality is quite low. Uh, whereas, for example, if we propose something to do an extra step in how network handshakes work or something like that, uh, it may be quite straightforward and practical to do that, or perhaps upgrading a library or something like that. This is a change that can be done in a matter of days or weeks with uh, limited impact on the system. Okay, then third, you have a philosophical conversation. 
and the philosophical point is, this is kind of like, is this a good idea according to my values? I strongly disagree all the time with Donald. He's a community member in the ETC community and he writes these blog posts. And generally speaking, uh, the reason why we disagree is we carry different values. So he, he just has different values than me, but we actually do agree on certain things like simplicity versus complexity or et cetera, et cetera. So this is where you actually start getting into the opinion stage. Uh, these are more fact finding. And the point of fact finding is to give the person who's proposing an idea the proper platform necessary to be able to discuss that idea in a way where everybody who has an opinion at least understands what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish, and the order of magnitude of difficulty of this particular idea. And again, uh, this is all about supporting evidence and conversation. So you would expect to see questions like, has this been implemented in other systems? Uh, or has this succeeded or failed before? Uh, things like, is this just an idea or does there exist a formal paper or a formal specification or code? Uh, like, has this already been implemented as a branch of an existing client and we just have to pull it in? Okay, these types of things. And it's an opportunity for Q&A, lots and lots and lots of questions. And the point of the questions are clarity. So people can better understand why they're doing this, what they're trying to do, how they're trying to accomplish it. Okay. The philosophical side is the first time where we start actually having an explicit opinion. Now, uh, in the Treasury debate, ETC Labs decided to start here. We hadn't even presented an ECIP. We hadn't even really done anything. We even didn't have a conversation about it. In fact, the first conversation was Thursday of last week, and we had no opportunity to even discuss what we were thinking, no opportunity to talk about the practicality of what we were doing. Rather, they said, this is against the values of Ethereum Classic. They said that in their blog post. Okay, well, then what are the values of Ethereum Classic? I did a prior video about simplicity versus complexity, and we all kind of agree this concept of code is law, but code is law has nothing to say about changes in monetary policy, because if it did, we've already violated it. We changed the monetary policy. I was there in the early days of ETC. We decided to put a hard cap and there was a community-wide discussion about that. So we changed from what Vitalik had constructed to a new monetary policy. Okay, so that doesn't seem to violate the values of CODIS law. And as for who gets paid, that was an arbitrary decision that was made by Vitalik. So we should live with that decision forever. So there was really no enumeration of what, what does this buzzword values mean? And so that's the point of the philosophical conversation is to be very specific. Donald, as much as we disagree, is specific about his values. And I enjoy that clarity from that perspective. I would love to see other people do that. So let's think about uh, the first part of the conversation, random X, uh, which is Monero's uh, proposed consensus algorithm versus SHA-3. This is a question that and by the way, there was nothing productive said in that meeting about these things. I said, well, can we vote? Oh, we don't vote. Okay, well, what do we do? Well, first off, understanding uh, there are, I guess, ECIPs. We never talked about them. There is a practicality question. Uh, there are questions like supply chain of ASICs, for example. If you're going to go to an ASIC-friendly algorithm, you have to understand, does one person have a monopoly over that supply chain or is this open and there is com competition and I as an outside party can purchase one of those ASICs to participate? If only one person controls the supply chain, only one person can decide whether you get to mine or not. Is that a decentralized consensus algorithm or a centralized consensus algorithm? And yes, you can make the argument, well, you know, it's open world. Anybody can create their own labs and do their own research. And that's true, but if the barrier to entry is five or $10 million or one to $5 million or quarter million to half million dollars, these are all very different categories with very different populations. When you're talking about five to 10 million, you'd need a company like IO Global to make a strategic bet there. If you talk about one to 5 million, 
maybe you could do some community funding. If you're talking about half a million dollars, an individual uh, who wants to take a, a risk could probably do that. Okay, so while you're having these discussions, this is what the, cl the clarifying questions come up. What is the barrier to entry? What's the supply chain look like? How many people are participating? Can we do an open source ASIC or not? Uh, what is our anticipated hash rate? What's the transition look like? All of these things are clarifying questions. And the point is not to come up with a judgment immediately, but rather fully appreciate and understand who what the person proposing is trying to accomplish, okay? And then we get to the philosophical side, and this is where opinion gets introduced, and uh, that's where you start asking, okay, ASIC resistance or no ASIC resistance, what do I feel about that? It is maximally inclusive to have ASIC resistance. Why? Because everybody's got a laptop and a desktop, and everybody can buy graphics cards. These are consumer products that are extremely well distributed, and the odds are that you have a much more egalitarian pool of computation. The downside is that you're much more uh, at the mercy of botnets. You're much more at the mercy of a volatile hash rate. And so your probability of 51% attacks goes way up. The person who has to buy an ASIC is some, especially if it's the only uh, al uh, cryptocurrency using that algorithm, uh, they're pretty vested in the success of the system. So you actually get better than 51%. Uh, resistance because while on the surface is 51%, the very people who would be doing the attack would be destroying effectively the value of their mining hardware if they attacked you. So it's almost like proof of stake in that respect. You're getting some intrinsic endogenous security connected to the value of the token as opposed to just uh, a mercenary exogenous argument. Okay, so there's strong arguments to make on both sides, and these arguments aren't necessarily technological, they're philosophical about who should be participating in consensus uh, and what does one CPU, one vote mean and so forth. And reasonable people can disagree, but at least those reasonable people fully appreciate and understand the practicality and exactly what the proposal is before they even have that conversation. And then finally, the last stage, because uh, you, know, you have to make decisions, the last stage is looking at alternatives. Okay, so alternatives compared to what? So even if, for example, uh, you were doing SHA-3, there are other things we could do. SHA-256, uh, there's even ASICs, I think, for script at this point. So even if you're pro-ASIC, there are other algorithms that you could potentially compare. And so once you've done the job of understandability and practicality and philosophy, okay, this is option one, option two, oopsie, still getting used to this Wacom tablet, option two, dot, 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 you have N options here. And you have to be able to score these options inside your decision space. And it should be a policy that you at least have two to three of these in the set. You should have at least two to three. Because if you have two to three options, then at least there's a real conversation having. If you just have one option, there's no conversation. And this is where uh, governance comes into play. The point of a governance process is to ensure that you have this diversity of thought and that people are feel free to participate. It's to ensure that when people are participating here, they have a fair chance to have a discussion without criticism because they have a right to be heard if they're willing to put the time and the effort to volunteer writing an ECIP and proposing a solution. That's not trivial. It takes a lot of resources to do that and a lot of time to do that uncompensated. And then, you know, when you have a philosophical conversation, this is a sampling of your community. And where do they stand? And people really aren't used to uh, having strong philosophies be explicit. We all implicitly have values. 
and things in the gut don't feel right. But philosophers are the ones who write these things down and make strong arguments. And uh, they, they actually have a, a core about how their philosophy is self-consistent. Well, similarly, ETC needs to go through this exercise because the reality is we can never come to consensus or agree if we have implicit philosophical differences. Because the reality is that these things can all be very awesome. But when you start getting to the philosophy side of things, if you're here and I'm here, even though we could probably find common ground, uh, we're not going to find that common ground because we're philosophically strongly opposed to each other. We carry different values. So at some point you have to make a decision. And actually this is the source of all hard forks, reasonable hard forks in our space. Uh, what ends up happening is the philosophical differences get too strong. And then uh, the decision space of one group is just pairwise disjoined from the decision space of the other group, meaning that they can't agree and they have to go in separate directions. For example, in ETH, the decision space was how, what is the best way, most practical way to do a hard fork to reverse a transaction. In the ETC realm, there was no hard fork. So one was discussing different ways of doing something. The other was saying, don't even do it at all. There's no compatibility between these two ideas. And as a consequence, there was no reconciliation. And if you go with this side, you end up with a completely alternative system with a fundamentally different philosophy. The challenge is that this alternative system didn't do a lot of work on building consensus around a unified philosophy. And that's kind of a silly thing when people say, oh, but we're decentralized. We don't need to do that. Uh, that's not true. Decentralized means no one's in control, but let's be clear here. A cryptocurrency is an encapsulation of values and philosophy. They're value-driven systems. They're mission-driven systems. And there's a million implicit things you agree to when you are in that ecosystem, if you're a non-speculator. Uh, for example, if you're in Bitcoin, you could walk around and say, hey, let's change the monetary policy from 21 million to 22 million coins. You'd be laughed out. It's never going to happen because the philosophy of Bitcoin is this finite monetary policy. And uh, there's a very strong Austrian bent in their viewpoint. If you walk into Bitcoin and say, let's go from proof of work to proof of stake, even if you make an incredible scientific argument about it, as many have, the values are simply different. So it's kind of a silly thing to say that even though this ecosystem is decentralized, uh, that, that somehow this means that we can never reach consensus on philosophy. We do. So much so that, of course, F Labs seems to think they know the values of ETC, put it into a blog post, and before we even have an opportunity to have a discussion, say it's a non-starter because it's against the values of ETC, whatever they are. Uh, so not enough work, in my view, has been done in the community at reaching a consolidation of philosophy. And if, and if this hypothesis is right, I'm deeply concerned that there's not going to be a good resolution for the challenges that are coming ahead. Uh, things as simple as random X versus SHA-3, it's an unanswerable question unless you have the philosophical side figured out. Because ultimately, you're not asking algorithm A or algorithm B. You're asking who's in control. This checkpointing idea that we're pushing through is another example of that. The checkpointing idea basically makes ETC immune to 51% attacks. They just can't happen with the system that we're proposing. However, it means that you have to accept a federated backup system. Now, we can put lipstick on this pig and go to an alternative system where there's a dedicated blockchain that does that. But at the end of the day, you're going from saying all of the consensus is internal to the system and it's a self-contained unit to it's a system plus another system. That other system can be another blockchain. It can be a checkpointing federation. It can be blah. Whatever blah happens to be, it's saying you're going from one source of truth to n sources of truth. Now, we can make it more palatable. For example, we could pick, uh, rotate the quorum for the federation by people who had mined certain types of blocks that tend to come up with some degree of randomness, like the Nipapaus concept or things like that. 
uh, we could do all kinds of kabuki and things. But at the end of the day, you're accepting that there is a federation. Now, you could also have an opt-in system. There's question of values, opt-in, opt-out. Proof of work is an opt-out system. You actively have to modify things to get out of it. Uh, the checkpointing system that we're proposing is opt-in, where you can choose just to follow the proof of work chain or the proof of work chain with checkpoints. Exchanges would probably want to do that because it would protect them against 51% attacks and it's in their best interest. But again, this is a values conversation. We can't really get any resolution on this values conversation until we have a philosophical understanding of it. But even if we have a strong philosophy, you need the other two things to be done. People actually have to fully understand what you're trying to do. So you write it in the ECIP, you do presentations, you give a lot of opportunity for Q&A, and that's how these meetings should be. Audio meetings should not be used to make decisions or filter things, because what if a person doesn't speak English? How's that fair to them? ETC is a global movement. There are people who only speak Chinese. What, they're going to show up and somehow participate? It, when it's written down, at least they have the opportunity to use some form of a translation mechanism to try to understand what the hell you're doing, or else they're going to have to find intermediaries to, to come in. That's just linguistically biased. It doesn't make sense in a decentralized global ecosystem. And then practicality is another deeply technical conversation that comes into the ECIP process of how much risk are we taking? How much complexity are we taking? Are we going to have to hard fork for this? Okay, this is all information gathering. Good governance allows this system to happen organically. The better you are at it, the more people participate and the more creative you happen to be in that process. And uh, that creativity will invite lots and lots and lots and lots of alternatives in your decision space. Then you can have deep philosophical conversations with the community and saying, we have four or five, 10, 15 good options of where to go and what to do. But you know what? The differences now are no longer practicality or understanding how to get it done. It's now values. And what are our values? We did this actually with the monetary policy debate. It was very successful in the early days of ETC because there were a lot of different ideas for monetary policy. The two big philosophies were deflationary or inflationary. Does the supply have a cap and it grows towards that cap like Bitcoin does? Uh, or is the supply just persistent inflation and it's uncapped and they just keep growing and growing and growing and growing? And there were strong arguments on both sides. And we had in that decision space lots of things. But because ETC tends to follow a BTC style philosophy of immutability in CODA's law, we also tended to borrow some of the other BTC ideas like that Austrian monetary policy concept. And so we ended up adopting that, and that value is pretty much set. The treasury proposal uh, that we're prepared to create is agnostic to the monetary policy. It's possible to fit it into the current monetary policy or an expanded new monetary policy. Okay, So you don't actually have to have a value position on the monetary policy to be able to participate in that. You, can, you have multiple options in the decision space that can be reflected accordingly. So I think there's a better way of doing things. And I don't think these meetings are productive at all. Uh, I brought everybody, my CTO, Brian, a uh, developer, a scientist, and we were prepared to do a full presentation. We had prepared a 30 minute video uh, before and we had a PowerPoint ready to go. We actually had code ready to go to show people and we could walk them through it and have discussions about the practicality of putting it into Geth or Besu uh, or other clients. Uh, in addition to just the Mantis client. And actually, we're going to show a video this week of a 51% attack. I was walking into that meeting with the belief that we were just going to be about understandability and practicality and be available to answer all questions. We were told we only have five minutes. It's just one item on the agenda. There's many items on the agenda of which major philosophical changes to the consensus, the heart, the single most important discussion you're ever going to have as a cryptocurrency, we're also on the agenda. Um, and you don't discuss these things, frankly, uh, for a 51% attack mitigation. You just don't. Uh, you discuss these things because you're actually discussing who should be in control of the system. That's deeply philosophical. And we 
of course are new. We've come back after being out of the ecosystem for a while. So obviously we don't understand the implementation path at the moment. We do have some sense of practicality because we build proof of work systems and we've done research in that space. So we could of course give opinions on how would you transition to a system, you know, like a, a gradual transition, a hard fork combinator style approach, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We could give some comment there, but there's a lot of understandability work that we have to do to catch up. We're happy to do that. That's our end. Uh, but this is not productive to blend this in with a 51% attack conversation and blend it in with a checkpointing uh, conversation. And especially since there's no mechanism apparently to explicitly have a conversation about the values of the ecosystem. In fact, in that meeting, the filtering meeting, they said, we're not going to talk about philosophy or values. Okay. So how the fuck do you filter anything? I'm sorry, I, it's not enthusiasm that makes me yield that comment. And I understand we're not going to vote. So I'm. And how do you filter if you're not voting? Isn't the act of filtering voting on the things you don't want? So nothing makes sense to me about this particular process. And uh, as I said, we're new here. Uh, we'll, we'll try to accommodate and find a way to do things. But this is uh, my proposal for moving forward to make some difficult decisions, not just about what's in front of us, which is how do we get past the 51% attack, but also major philosophical conversations about how do we get to a consolidated roadmap? How are we going to get use and utility for the system? Uh, how are we going to preserve the underlying philosophy of Coda's law? And what does that actually mean to people in the system? These fundamental things. Uh, and uh, how are we going to compete? with the other 500 options that are on market. Um, it's not good enough to say you're against something. That's great. Uh, I'm against plenty of things in life. It tells you nothing about who I am. Uh, it tells you nothing about whether you want to be my friend or not. You want to associate with me or not. Being against something is not a philosophy. It's just a preference choice. Tell us where you want to go, what you want to do. And good governance is a process that makes people feel empowered to do that. Even if they lose in the end, they feel like they had a voice and they had a say. Uh, and they feel like they weren't censored and there was, no, uh, there was no shenanigans or kabuki. I don't feel like this process right now is very inclusive. I had no opportunity to have any discussion about understandability or practicality before incumbents in the system said that this idea is a non-starter and immediately opposed it. Uh, and then we showed up with the full idea of explaining checkpointing in a very rigorous way. And we were given no opportunity in the process to realistically do that. In fact, the channel they told us to go to, we went to and waited in 10 minutes. And apparently the meeting was being held in a different channel. And they had already started the meeting without us, knowing full well that we were waiting in the other channel. It's not an inclusive process, especially given that some people can't participate in audio. Uh, some people don't want to participate in that format. It needs to be done differently. So I hope this provides some uh, clarity on how we think and how we make decisions. Uh, we've written a lot of this down. We have a CIP process uh, for Cardano, uh, Cardano Improvement Proposal process. We spent six months working on it. Uh, and the very first CIP is how the CIP process works. And there's already people proposing changes to it. And we think about governance and decision making exhaustively with the Voltaire project in Cardano. Uh, we even have partners like Submittable and an innovation management firm, um, IdeaScale. And we work with them to ask not just how do you get consent to do something, but rather how do you have a discussion so that when you get to the point to give consent, uh, even if people are in the minority side and they lose, they at least understand why you chose what you chose and more often than not can go along with it and see where it goes so that you don't end up with what happened with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, where you have this very contentious, very hostile split that shatters the ecosystem, permanently damaging the ecosystem, losing great people along the way. If ETC is to survive and be competitive, have a real roadmap, be able to fund that roadmap, we must have a good governance system. And it's my opinion that the incumbent one is definitely not going to get it done. It's uh, definitely a good system if all you're doing is deciding whether you want to adopt an idea from Ethereum or not. So if you're filtering ideas that other people come up with, uh, that'll probably work. If you want to actually change things, go on your own trailblazing, go do real stuff. 
uh, you have to have a much more robust way of discussing things. So I hope this helps. Uh, as I mentioned in the meeting, uh, we'll have an ECIP available for the Treasury and an ECIP available for the checkpointing system on Wednesday next week. Uh, we released a video today on the checkpointing system discussing the science of it. We will release a video before the end of the week uh, demonstrating recovery from a 51% attack. Uh, I would also love the Pearl Guard and the Veriblock guys to participate in this structure. Uh, there was really no representation for their viewpoints in that meeting. Because I was actually really interested in understanding and practicality. I was hoping we could have a, that discussion and they could also do presentations and explicitly show how their solutions work. These solutions have different implications in terms of liveness and persistence and also how that federation works, whether it be an external system or an, uh, a wired on system like the BFT system that we're proposing. And you know, I'm agnostic actually to this. We're writing an ECIP because this is an in-house solution, uh, but we don't embrace not invented hereism at IOHK. We, we're happy to entertain other ideas. And um, I really would love to understand more about the implementation path and the security model and what validation they have. And this is their opportunity to shine. And I would be just as happy selecting one of those solutions over the checkpointing solution that we're bringing to the table. We're only bringing this solution because we understand it. We created it, we've implemented it. We know for a fact it solves the problem, but it does carry some philosophical weight to it that distinctly has an impact as Donald and other people have pointed out in their conversations. And we're happy to have that discussion as well. Let's do that instead of what happened today. It's very bizarre. Anyway, thanks for listening. I hope this video helps uh, bring a bit more clarity and I'll keep making them because it's my channel and I can make them. And that's the beautiful thing about having alternative distribution mechanisms is that it gives you a voice. And I would highly encourage any member of the ETC community to not feel silenced or censored, but to do the exact same thing. Uh, use your own channels. And if you do, even if I disagree with you, I will retweet your videos and your content uh, because you need to have a voice in this uh, if ETC is to actually converge and decide what it's going to do. And don't ever allow anybody to tell you that this is not the process. Um, if the process was so good, you'd already have a solution and you'd already be a pretty innovative system. It's not. It's a reactive process that seems to be constructed to follow another cryptocurrency and make arbitrary decisions of whether to adopt something or not. It's not a process for creativity. It's not a process for innovation. And it sure as hell is not a process that actually explicitly writes philosophy down. Thanks so much.